We begin today in the Gemara and Afkufam with Beis in the Mishnah at the bottom of the Yomad. Zaktaylege Mishnah Amoyche Zaysov Leitzim. A person sold an olive tree for the purpose that the buyer is going to chop the tree down and use it for firewood. But then he didn't chop it down right away. He left it to grow there in the property of the seller. Vaosu Pachas Mirivias and it produced olives. And the olives are so bad quality that the oil you get out of these uh, out of these olives is less than a revius of oil. L'sa'ah, for the amount of a sa'ah of olives that grew on the tree. So who gets these olives here? Hare'elu shobal hazaisim. So the buyer of the tree is the one that gets these olives. Even though it grew from the property of the seller. But because the tree is his and it's so little, so the bal hazaisim can keep it. Also revius l'sa'ah, but if it produced... And the minimum of a revius of oil for the amount of a saw or more. So then, here the, the, there's going to be an argument. The one, the buyer says, it's my tree now. So my tree uh, produced these olives. And the seller, the owner of the, of the property itself says, no, but it's, it's uh, growing in my ground. So therefore these olives belong to me. The Allah is that they divide it. Another case, Shotaf nor Zesov. What happens if a person had an olive tree in his property and a river overflowed and it, dra- it dragged along a tree with it, and it placed it down and it got replanted in your friend's property and now it's growing over there and it grew olives. So the owner of the tree says, it's my tree that grew the olives. No, the other person says, but your tree is now my property, so it's my soil, it's my property that the trees grew from. So here as well, the Allah is that they divide this. So the Gemara starts with the first case of the Mishnah, where the Mishnah said it depends how, many, how much olives or how much oil you got out of these olives. Who, who will uh, get it? What's the case over here? If the seller told the buyer, I'm selling you this tree, chop down, chop, chop it down, take the wood and do it immediately. So then he's not supposed to keep his tree to grow and take the nourishment from the soil of this person's ground. Whatever grew, even if it grew less than a revius, it should belong to the owner of the property, the seller. Because he says, look, you left, you weren't supposed to leave your tree here, you left it here, it grew from my karka. So as long as you leave it here, I get all the olives. Is the boy is caught. And if, when he sold him the tree, he told him clearly that you chop down the wood, but you have time. Whenever you wish, you can cut it down. So then, I feel a revius nami lebalzeisim. So even if it grew more than the amount the Mishnah said, the revius, it should also belong to the owner of the tree because he told him clearly that you have time. Whenever you want, you can cut it. So whatever grows on that tree, it's his tree, and he gave him time to allow it to take nourishment from the ground. So he should be able to keep all his olives. Who's the balzeisim? The owner of the tree, the buyer, the buyer of the tree the itself. Yeah. Okay. And to the Gemara, Lloyd Sriche, so the only way, time we need the, 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 the distinction the Mishnah said of here is the Omale Stoma. When the, when the seller tells him, I'm selling you the street to chop it down for the wood. And he didn't make up with him. Should you chop it down right away? Should you take it? Could, do you have permission to keep it? They didn't make up anything with him. So over here is where the Mishnah says, this is how we estimate the das of the seller. That if it's pachas mirivies, if it grows olives that are less than mirivies, it didn't take so much <coughs> nourishment from the ground. Lick up the inchi. So for that, people are not particular. So the, the buyer gets it all. Rivies, but if it grew more and it took more nourishment from the ground, so here kapti inchi. This is something that people are particular about. I sold you this tree. I didn't make up a particular time, but you're leaving it here to grow so many olives and taking so much nourishment from my ground. You should take it away from here. So here people are makpid, and therefore the owner of the of the karka says it's mine. The owner of the tree, the balazesim, says it's mine. And here's where the Mishnah says yachleiku. Clarified regarding the shear that the Mishnah said it grows a revius of oil that you can get from these olives. So the revius sha'amru, this revius that it said, that's besides the expenses, because there are certain expenses when you have the olives that you have to cut them and then press the olives. So you have to deduct the value of the pressing and whatever else is involved from this amount. And then if you have left from it the value of a revius, then this is what the Mishnah said that we split it between them. The next case, the Mishnah said, Shotaf nor Zesov, a river came and dragged a person's tree and replanted it in his friend's fra- pra- property. So there the Mishnah said that each one gets half. They're arguing, it's my tree that grew, the other one says, it's my ground that grew, so they each one get half. 
Amar Ule, on this Ule said, Amar Eishlakish and Reimer Eishlakish to clarify what the case of the Mishnah here is. Lo Yishanu, the din of the Mishnah wasn't said, Ela, only in the following case. Shanekru Begusheyen, that the tree was uprooted by this river together with the earth around the tree. And that's how it was planted in the, in the friend's property. Asher explains that this is based on the Mishnah in Arla that says, there's the din of Arla. First three years you can't use, have any anna from the tree. So what happens if a tree gets replanted? It depends. If the tree was totally uprooted without any earth and you planted it somewhere else, it's like a fresh tree. You're going to have to wait again three years. But if the tree that was uprooted was planted again somewhere else together with the earth around it, so it's still the same tree it was. It's still alive with those gushim. So therefore, there's no din of Arla that applies. You can eat from it right away. So Rish Lakish says that here our mission is talking about that it got uprooted with the earth around it. So even for the first three years, the din of Arla will not apply. But this that the Mishnah says that you will have to split the tree, the, the zaysim of the tree, between the owner of the tree and the owner of the karka, the ground, that's after three years. But within the first three years, the owner of the tree, the balazesim, he's the one that gets all the olives. Why is that? Because he says to the owner of the, of the karka, he ought not this, if you would have not planted, planted a new tree here, within the first three years, would you be able to eat anything? There's a din of Arla. The first three years, you couldn't eat anything. So the first three years, the only reason that you can have enough from these Zaysim is because it's my tree and my Gushim around it. So therefore, the first three years, I should get it all. After three years, okay, then we could split it. Then it's my tree and it's also your karka. But within three years, it, it's all my tree. I think I'm going to ask on this. Belay, Malay, let the owner of the karka answer him back and say, Ia non noti. If I would plant my own tree here, I'm not interested in having your tree. I'm ready to uproot your tree and I'll plant my own tree here. If I would plant my own tree, after three years, I would be able to eat the entire, everything from this tree. It's growing in my ground, my soil, and I would eat it all for myself. Now what happens after three years, because your tree is here on my property, so therefore I have to split with you after three years. So if I'm splitting with you after three years, so then I should be able to get something also half from the, the three years before. So he's claiming then there should be some kind of exchange over here. After three years, I really don't want your tree here at all. And I'm allowing your tree to be here, and therefore we, I'm forced to split with you. So just like I'm giving up after three years for you, so before the three years, even though it's true that before three years I shouldn't be able to eat anything because then it would be our law, but I shouldn't exchange for what I'm giving up after the three years, get half before the three years. What does it have to happen before the three years if it's our law? It's, but it's not our law. Here, Bupayal, it's not our law, right? Because it came with the Gushim. So, but, so he's telling him that Anachanami, I shouldn't have rights to that, but I, I'm giving up after the three years. So in exchange for what I'm giving up after, I should also get before. So Elokiyah Saravin, Omar Rishlokish, Saravin came and said in the name of Rishlokish as well, but differently. The Rishlokish explained the Mishnah the opposite of what we said. And the holding of the mission that we split it between the two of them. So that's only, so he starts off again, that it was, what happened is this tree was uprooted from its place with the earth around it. And then it was replanted in the friend's property. Now he said like as follows, only within the first three years, then I say that you split between them the olives that grow. Once it comes after three years, <laughs> then it all belongs to the Balakarka. Because the Amale, because the Balakarka says to him, After three years, he tells him, Now I have no gain from you, from your tree being here. I don't want your tree here, Bukhlal. If I would plant my own tree, this is my property, it's not your property. So if I would plant my own tree over here, I would get the entire thing for myself. So now that your tree is here on my property, you shouldn't have any rights to this. I get the entire olives for myself. It's within three years where then if I would have planted, it would have been our law. Now that it's your tree, so therefore it came with the Gushim. So it's not our law. So over here, your tree that grows on my property, I'll get half and you'll get half. But now the Gemara asks over here the que- that, that you can ask the question the reverse. The lay, malay, shouldn't the owner of the tree say to the owner of the ground, he at not this betech shalish, but like we said before, if you, if the owner of the ground would have planted a brand new tree here in these three years, you wouldn't have had anything because then there's Arla. With the first three years, you get nothing. 
Hashtag achles palge badoi. So now you're getting half together with me within the th first three years. And then afterwards, after the three years, I'm getting nothing. If you're going to get half with me within the first three years, even though you're gaining by this, because if you would have been planting the tree yourself, you would have gotten nothing because it would have been Arla. So you're getting with me within the first three years, so then I should be getting half with you even after the three years. Why are we saying that I have to give up for the first three years? And then in exchange, afterwards, I don't have to give you anything. After the first three years, you say, I don't want you to treat my property, I'm giving you nothing. Why should we say that? So the Gemara answer is, no, Mishum Da'om Alei, over here there's an answer to this. Because the owner of the property actually says to him that I'm not gaining anything from the fact that, you, that now your tree is here and it's not our law and therefore I can eat from your tree. I'm not gaining anything by that because on the, uh, what happens is like this. If I would have planted myself a tree without your tree. So then... True, I wouldn't be able to eat from the fruits because it would be our law, but I would have another gain anyways because I have a ketini. Then it would be a small sapling, it would be a small tree. And then because there's not so much shade, I would have sunlight and I would be able to plant here beets or other vegetables. So even, it would be, even though I would have the loss of the fact that it's our law, that I couldn't eat the fruits, but I would have vegetables here. So the fact that I'm getting from you now the ability to eat the fruits within the th first three years, I'm not gaining anything by that, that you could demand from me that in exchange you should get a portion of the olives after the, fir after the first three years. After the first three years, it's my property. I don't want your tree here. It's totally mine. I have no gain from you. So the owner of the property gets it all. Within the first three years, he says to him that really I'm not gaining anything because I would have planted the beets and the vegetables under it. So therefore, he says to him, within the first three years, since the fact is, it would have been our law, and it's only because of his gushim that it's not our law, so therefore you split it. But I don't have to give you anything else in exchange after the th th uh, three years. After the three years, then he, he, he takes the whole thing for himself. And that's the maskan of the pshari of the Mishnah that is talking about after three years. That's when they split it. But the remote doesn't say, hey, so tell me how you let him get have it there three years to begin with. He let him? Yeah, he let, he let him. He, yeah, here, that, that says something too. Oh, one second. Here the Gemara is going to say, one second, let's see. Tone, so we learned in Abraise, Omar Allah, if this person, the owner of the tree, comes and says, Zay Sayani Neitel, I'm taking, I want to take my olive tree back and uh, replant it uh, somewhere else, in my property. Ain Shaymeloi, we don't listen to him. My time, eh? why don't we allow him to take it? Now, as we just passed in there, what's going to happen after three years is that the owner of the property gets it all all the fruits that grow, and the, the owner of the tree gets nothing. Yeah, so he wants to take back his tree, but we don't allow him to take the tree away. My time, Omer Rabbi Yechen, Rabbi Yechen says, the reason is, Mishum Yishuv Eretz Yisrael. If this is in Eretz Yisrael, and because of settling the land of Eretz Yisrael, we want trees that are planted to remain where they are, and not to uproot them. Even if the person says he's going to plant it somewhere else, it doesn't matter. He, he sold him a tree to cut, okay, it's a shayla b'chlal, how can you cut a uh, olive tree? Okay, that's a good question. But here he says, Mishum Yishu v'Eretz Yisrael, we don't allow him to take away his tree. No, this is all in Eretz Yisrael. So the Rabbi Yechen is saying, this Allah had dafke in Eretz Yisrael. Then there's the union of Yishu v'Eretz Yisrael, where we don't allow him to uproot the tree. Yeah, in Hanami, true, but still in Eretz Yisrael, you can't uproot a tree. Even if he says he's going to replant it somewhere else, but you don't know if it's going to grow. In Eretz Yisrael, yeah, yeah, he's not allowed to uproot it. Rabbi Yirmiyeh, Rabbi Yirmiyeh says on this, This is a big chiddush. This halacha that he's not allowed to uproot it for this reason is, is, is a big chiddush. That uh, Rabbi Yechanan said. Okay, why, why exactly it's a big chiddush? The Rishayim discussed this, but that's, that's uh, what he's told him. Now here, the, this statement Rabbi Yechanan said, that Rabbi Yirmiyeh said on this, that it's a big chiddush, the Gemara brings another halacha where there was a similar comment that Rabbi Yirmiyeh said on Rabbi Yechanan that it's a big chiddush. Tanan, Hosam, so there's a Mishnah in the Mai that says the following Allah. Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda says, A person that's a makabal. A makabal is a person, a worker, a sharecropper that works in a property and he gets a certain percent of the produce. And what property is this? Stay a it's a, a property of his ancestors, it's from a guy. The guy has it now. Okay, the Gemara is going to explain what's going on over here. But now this Yid is working in this property that the guy has now. What does he do? Ma'aser v'naisen lai. So all the produce that grows in the property, first you have to give the ma'aser from everything. Only after you give ma'aser of everything, including the percent that's going to go to the guy, 
Only after that do you give the percent to the guy. In other words, you don't divide it and give the guy his percent and take your percent to yourself. And only from your percent you take the meister. No, you have to take meister from the entire thing and only then you give it to the guy. So the Gemara explains what is this Bryce is saying here. Or actually this Mishnah is saying here. So Sevrua, they thought to say that the Pshad in this Mishnah is as follows. First of all, Mais Dea Vaisa. When it says that this is a property of his ancestors, what does that mean? It means Eretz Yisrael. It just means it's a property in Eretz Yisrael that a guy owns. My is Dea Vaisa. Why is it called the property of his fathers? It means Dea Avram Yitzchak V'yakit. It's the property of our ancestors, Avram Yitzchak V'yakit. Okay, that's what we're talking about. A property in Eretz Yisrael that a guy bought, and a Yid is now a worker, a sharecropper for this guy. Now, why are we saying he has to give myself everything, including from what the guy, uh, the percent that the guy gets? So the Gemara explains there's a few things, uh, a few details to understand this. Number one, Kesava, the town of this Mishnah holds, Ein Kenyan Lenachri Beretz Yisrael Lafkiyah Miyad Maiser. A guy buys a property in Eretz Yisrael, so yeah, there's a change of ownership that he owns it, but not to take away the kedusha of the land. That doesn't change. So since it grew in Eretz Yisrael, even when it grows in the possession of a guy, it's still chayiv and Maiser. That's one thing. Another thing, but you can still ask, okay, but why should the Yid that takes his percent have to separate Maise even from the percent of the guy? That's not this Yid's obligation. Now, then there's another detail we say here. There's two kinds of uh, agreements that you make with a worker in a field. Either you could be a Makabal, a Makabal is someone that gets a certain percent of the produce that, it, that it, the property produced, and a Choycher is something else. A Choycher is basically a lease where you, you lease the property, and then there's a certain set amount that you pay to the owner of the property, whether it produces, whether it doesn't produce. It's not a percent of, uh, of the actual produce. It's a certain percent that you say you're going to give him, regardless of how much it produced. What's the difference between them? And Makabal is, is a sharecropper, so he's getting only a certain percent of what it, what, what it made. A choicher, it's, it's a lease. So you, you, basically, whatever it produces is yours. LMI, there's a certain amount that you owe him for the lease that you have to pay him. So now the Gemara explains this as follows. Just like when it comes to a person that's leasing the property, whether it produced, whether it doesn't, you have to take Meiser from all that it produced and only then do you give it to him. Why? Because because when you pay him the amount for the lease, it's like you're just paying him a loan or you're paying him what you owe him for the lease. Meaning over here, by the lease, the deal is everything that grows is yours. Elamai, there's a certain set amount, regardless of how much it produced. Certain set amount that you have to pay me for this. But the, the produce itself that it produced it really belongs all to the Yid. So he has to take my out of everything, and only then could he, could he pay it to the guy. But now, this Mishnah holds, af makabal nami, by a makabal as well, even though you may say, this percent is mine. The other percent belongs to the guy. The percent that belongs to the guy has nothing to do with me. But no, we view the makabal in the same way. Nami ki domi. It's also considered to be like the yid really is taking the whole thing for himself. Elamai then he divides the percent. He takes one percent for himself, and then there's the percent that he owes for the guy. And therefore, the same Allah will apply over here. Ma'asr ve'nayson lai. He has to take off the ma'isa first, and only then could he give the guy his percent. That's the pshat on this brayse and this mission that is again. So, the, but the point of here is that the guy does not the fact that he owns the property does not take away the chiyuv of meiser, and you're you're like leasing it, and therefore you have to take off all the meisers, including from the guy's uh, part as well, and only then do you give to the guy his part, his percent. That was the pshat lachat that they wanted to say in this Mishnah. But the Gemara asks, and there's some of kind of lot of papi, a lot of a lot of zvid, but Ella the Tanya. We have a brayse. This is a Mishnah, but then we have a brayse where it's also Rabbi Yehuda, and Rabbi Yehuda says the same halacha of the Mishnah with a little addition. Rabbi Yehuda, and Rabbi Yehuda says, a makabel stay avaysav mimeitzik nochri. A person that's a makabel is working in the property of his fathers, and by a guy. And here the Mishnah brayse here says it's a meitzik nochri. This is a guy which is a, a thief, a, a thug, and he he stole the property of your father. And here, the Braise says, Rabbi Yudha said, Ma'asr v'naisanoi, first you have to separate the maizas of everything, and only then do you give it to the guy. So the question is, what's this addition of the meitzik? My area meitzik. Why are we saying only this guy that's a thief? Afilei meitzik nami. According to the pshat that we just gave, that even if a guy buys the property, it doesn't take off the chiyuv of maizir, so that this shouldn't be only by a meitzik. So, hello, therefore the Gemara says, there's a completely different pshat over here in this Indian, and here we'll bring the pshat that, uh, from what Rabbi Yechenen said, and this is the Chiddush of Rabbi Yechenen. 
really Rabbi Yehuda holds, Yesh Kenny Lenachri Beretz Yisrael Afkia Miyad Maisa. When a guy buys a property in Eretz Yisrael, he acquires it, and once he acquires it, the obligation of Maisa goes away as well, once, as, as long as the guy owns it. And also, besides that, even if this wouldn't be true, but a makabel laf kachichadam, you can't compare a person that uh, takes the property with a lease and he just pays a set amount to a person that's a makabel that only takes a certain percent for himself, and the other percent is bchalal not yours; it belongs to the guy. So the shot over here when it says that this yid is working in the property of his ancestors that the guy has now. What does it mean? It means the avais of mamish. It literally means that this is a property of his father, his grandfather. That's what we're talking about. Not a, we're not not that stam saying a sodan eretz but this is taka a property that the person the yid is working in from his parents, and now it's in the guy's possession, and the guy stole it from this yid's parents. And now this seed is being hired by this guy, this Ganev, to work on this property. Now over here, the fact that the Yid has to give Maisa from this, and he has to give Maisa even of the portion of the guy, this is a Knas. And the Gemara will explain what this Knas is about. Only the day who the Kansur Rabbanon, it's to this son of his, of, of his father or his, or his grandfather that he's working now on this property that the guy sold, that the, that the Chachamim gave him a Knas, that he should pay Maisvis, not only on his portion that he gets, but even on the percent of the guy as well. The idea of the Chavivi Alei, because this is a property that belonged to his, to his father, to his grandfather, so this is a property that's beloved to him, Tafi Vaozel Mikabale. He's going to be ready to go and work in it, even though he knows that, that the percent that I get, I'm going to have to pay a lot of Maisvis from this, because I even have to give Maisvis from the percent of the guy. He's ready to, he's going he's gonna to go and work in this property. I will image the Alma, but if it would be anybody else, and it's, it's not, it wasn't a property that ever belonged to his father, so Eloi, he's not going to be interested in working this property. If a guy is going to try to hire anybody else in this property, and you're going to know that the halachi is, that you have to give Maisus not only from your percent, but even from the percent of the guy, anybody else is not going to want to work in this property. Okay, now, now, now the Gemara explains the, the point here itself. What, what is this idea of the Knasser? What are we saying? That this Yid works now on this property of a guy that stole it from your father. Why, what's the Knas? What did you do wrong? Why should you have to give uh, Maestas from, from what you have and from the guy's percent as well? So really, it's not, a, it's not really a Knas that you did something wrong, but the Gemara explains as follows. Day, my time the What's the point of this knas? So here, Amar Rabbi Yechanan, Rabbi Yechanan explained, Kdei in order that this should come back very strongly into his hands. So as Rashi explains, the point over here is, this is not really a knas, a penalty for what he did wrong. On the contrary, this is actually something to motivate him <laughs> to buy it off the guy. The Yid wants to work on this property because it belonged to his father, to his grandfather. So he's going to come and work on the property even though it's, he's working with, by a guy that stole it. And even though the guy, it's going to, he's going to have to end up paying mice even for what belonged to the guy, he's still going to want to work there because he wants to work on this property. But then eventually the Yid is going to say to himself, why am I working and paying so much mice even for the, what I don't get? So he's going to then be motivated to buy it off from the guy. That's what's going to happen. We want to motivate his son to buy it off from the guy. And that's only by a son. But if it would be anybody else, if they would hear that you're charging extra maestros over here, he would just walk away from the property. He's not, he's not, it's not going to accomplish anything. So therefore, Chachamim made this extra maestro that you have to pay for the, to motivate him to buy it off the guy. That was Rabbi Yechelen's pshat in this Mishnah and Braise. And on this, on Rabbi Yechelen, on Rabbi Yemir, that is, Kagoyin Dot Zricher Rabbe. This pshat that Rabbi Yechelen said here is a big chiddush that Chachamim created this knas, so to speak, to motivate him to buy it off the guy. This is a big chiddush. Itmar, we learned another machlaikis related to what we learned before here. A person that goes into his friend's property without his permission. He plants their trees, he does gardening for him and so on without his permission at all. So now, does the owner of the property have to pay him for this? Amarav, so Rav says, Shaman loy, we have to evaluate what he did. He gets paid, but he has the lower hand, which means if you look, you look at the expenses and you look at also the improvement of the property. Whichever one is less, that's what the, wor- the person that worked in this property without permission gets paid. Shmuel Amash says, No, you evaluate how much is a person ready to pay for a worker to do work in this property, and you pay, you pay him pro- properly, you pay him fully. 
Amar Rav Papa, so Rav Papa explained, V'loi pligi, Rav and Shmuel are not arguing here. It depends what kind of a property this is. Kam yalita. If it's a property, for example, someone planted you apple trees here, and this is an area that everybody plants apple trees, and therefore the fact that he planted for you these trees, it's something that this is what the property is made for. So then you have to pay him, even though he did it without permission, you have to pay him, and yodei al al you have to give him full pay. But if it's a property that's, you go and plant in someone's property trees that are, that's, that's not what the, the property is intended for, in such a case, then you have to pay him only yodei al You have to pay him either the expenses or the improvement, whichever one is less, that's what you pay him. Okay, there's a discussion of Rishayim about this. Some Rishayim say that uh, if the owner of the property refuses and says, take your trees out of here, you could. Okay, it's based, based also on what the Gemara says here in the continuation, as we'll see. Okay, so the Gemara, Vahad Rav, this halacha that we said here, that Rav says in a case where the property, he does not, it's, it's not made for these trees. And you plant it anyways there. So then you have to pay him, but Yadel Tachtaina, that Allah of Rav, Lav the Fedishitma. Rav never said it clearly, Allah Maklalitma, it's understood from what Rav Paskin regarding the story. There was a case where a person came to Rav and he said that someone planted on my property trees, and I never asked him to plant the property, the trees here. On Malay, so Rav tells him, Zil Shumle, go evaluate for him. What's the what's the value of the planting of the trees in this property? And pay him, pay him fully for what he did. Amalei, so the owner of the property said, but loy bina, who asked him to plant it there? I'm not interested in having these trees here. So Amalei, so then Rav said, if that's the case, zil shumlei v'yodel atachtoyne. If you don't want it, so then it's considered to be a place which is ena uh, suyelita. You don't want these trees here, so then you just pay him the lower price, whether the expenses or the improvement of the property, the lower price. Amalei, but this person still argued and said, Loi bina. I'm, I'm not interested in even paying law. Let him take his trees out of it. I don't want it at all. That's what this person was arguing. But then, Lusayf, in the end, Chazye, Rav, observed and saw this person, the owner of the property, the Godra, that he put a fence around those trees, the Kaminta law, and he's guarding it. So while he's claiming he doesn't want it, he's actually taking care of it, and he's expressing the fact that he does want it. So Amalei, so now Rav says to him, Golis Adaytech, you just revealed your intention, the Nichaloch. That you are interested in the trees that he planted for you. If so, zil shumle the yodel al yaina. Go pay him full price for the work that he did for you for the trees that he gave you. It's also a discussion Rishanim about this part, this story here, whether it was talking about a sadah suyalita or a sadah sha'ina suyalita, and it's up to him. Even upon him, it's, it's, the gemara itself doesn't spell out exactly the case here. Itmer, another machlekes, we learned about this subject. A person that went into a person's broken down house. Ubana, and he built up the house without the permission of the owner. Now the Oma Loi, the the contractor that did all this work, comes and says, Eight save I want to take back my wood, my 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 stones. I thought it'll be a good investment for me here at something, but nice. I want to take it all back. Rav Nachman Oma Shaiman Loi. Rav Nachman says, Yeah, he has the he has the right to take everything back. Rav Sheshu says, says, no, we don't listen to him. As Rishonim explained, once you went and put your stones and, uh, and, and wood, all your materials into his property, so you put it there for the purpose that it should become his. He's kind it with his chatzar. So now you can't take it back. It's too late. So the Gemara asks on this, we learned in Abra'i said, regarding such a case, it's based Shammai that said that we allow the one that built here to take back his things if he says he wants it back. But Basil says that we don't take it back. So the question is, how could Rav, Rav Nachman say like Rav Be- Beishamai? How could he pass like Beishamai that we listen to him? Leim Rav Nachman doma ke Beishamai. And says the Gemara, no, who doma ki? Hi Tana. There's another Brayse. We're there. There's another opinion. Tanya's we learn a Brayse. Shaymin loy. Devre Rav Shimon ben Alaza. Rav Shimon ben Alaza says that we do listen to him. Like Rav Nachman said, he can take back his materials. Rav Shem Gamliel Loime, Rav Shem Gamliel says, like we said before, Beshama Yamrim, Shem Eloi, or Beshila Loimrim, Ein Shem Eloi. Beshila argue and say that we don't listen to him. Amai Havi Allah, what is the halacha regarding this case? Could the person take back his materials if he wants or not? And Rav Yaakov, Amar Rav Yechenen, so Rav Yaakov says in the name of Rav Yechenen, Bebayis Shem Eloi. If someone came into your property and there was a broken down house and he built up the house, so now he wants to take back his materials, we'll listen to him. But if it's in a field, he planted in your field, and now he wants to take back his trees, here we do not listen to him. Why? What's the difference? Here the Gemara comes back to the Svara that Rabbi Yechon has said before, in a, in a property when someone planted trees, why can't he take it back? 
Mishom Yishuv Eretz Yisrael. Because in Eretz Yisrael, once a tree is planted, we want Eretz Yisrael to be a beautiful planted area, not just like a desert, so we don't allow him to take back his trees. Ikedomri, others say there's a different reason. Mishom Kocha Shodara, because once you plant it in his property, it, the, the tree planted here, took the nourishment from the soil of the property, so you can't plant and take nourishment from his property and then just uproot your tree and go away, and you weaken his property. Once you use this property, so you have to keep your tree there, because otherwise you're just going to leave him a weakened property. So you can't take back your tree anymore. And that doesn't apply, obviously, by a house that, that he built up. Amai benayu, what's the difference between these two reasons given there? Ike benayu, chutzlaretz. The difference is whether this applies outside of Eretz Yisrael or not. A person rents his house to his friend in the winter. You cannot uh, take out the renter from the house during the winter. From Sukkis until Pesach, you can't send him out of the house. That's a simple shot of the Mishnah. I'm going to explain exactly what this means. If it's in the summertime, for 30 days, you can't take him out of the house. Okay, the shot of the Mishnah is hard to understand. As I said, the Gemara will explain. If he's renting from you in a, in a large uh, city, not in, in an urban area, in a city where there's a lot of people, there's marketplaces. So over here, it's very hard to find a place to rent. So for 12 months, you can't uh, take him out of your house. If someone's renting from you a store, so then whether it's in smaller cities, whether in the larger cities where you have the big marketplaces, it's the same thing. You can't send them out for 12 months. And the reason is because this storekeeper has people that are buying from him on credit. And then over time, over 12 months, they pay up the credit that they owe. So if you're going to send them out within this time, he's not going to be able to collect the money that people owe him. Rabbi Shem Gamliel, Rabbi Shem Gamliel says, "Chanus shol nachtaimim." If it's a, if it's a store, if it's a baker, basically, or v'shol tzavon, or dyer, shol ishonim. You can't send them out for three years because of here, as the Gemara will say, he gives on credit, and you can pay much later. He gives on credit for a longer period of time, so you can't send them out for all this period of time. Okay, so the Gemara. What is the, the first halach over here in the Mishnah? There's a difference between the winter and the summer. The winter you can't send out a renter at all. In the summer, thirty days. What does this mean? What is the difference? So the, what, the way the Gemara understands this right now is that what this means is you rent a person a house and you tell him, I'm renting you this house for the whole winter. That's it. You tell him for the winter. So what do we say? When you told him the whole winter, when you tell him you're renting him the house for the winter, so that means the entire winter. So you can't send him out from Sukkot till Pesach. If so, you Nami, the Gemara now is understanding when it says that you rented him the house for the summer, what this means is you told him, I'm renting you this house for the summer. So that means, doesn't that mean the summer means the entire summer? Why regarding the summer does it say that after 30 days you could send him out? So Ella the Gemara tries and says, let's say the Pshat of the Mishnah is as follows. <coughs> During the winter, the reason over here is that the the Leishchiach Beis Elamega, that in the winter, what we're talking about over here is that you rented it out to him, but it, at the time of the rental is it ended, and in the winter, you can't send him out because he's not going to be able to find another place <laughs> where to rent. That's the reason why you can't send him out. But in the summer, because you can find another place to rent, so therefore, after 30 days, you're able to send him out. Hey, Ms. Seife, but if that's the case, the Gemara says, well, what does it say later in the Mishnah here? The Krachim, if it's a large city, whether it's the summer, whether it's the winter, you have to give him 12 months to find another place. When your rental is up, you have to give him time. You have to give him 12 months to find another place. But the question is, according to what we're saying, that the problem of the winter is that during the winter, you can't send someone out because it's very hard to find another place to live in. So you're basically sending him out into the street. But does that mean that by a store after, th- after uh, or sorry, not before we get to the store, in the large city, after where it's very hard to find a rental, after a year, after 12 months, you can send them out, and that's even if the year is up in the middle of this winter, when it's very hard for him to find a new rental. Why should Vamai, Holy Shrich, Basil, Megar, but he's not going to be able to find a new house to rent? If that's the point here, if the Pshat of here is that during the winter it's hard to find a rental, so then any time you shouldn't be allowed to send out a person from the house from this rental during the winter at all. 
so from the safe of the Mishnah, it's mashma that in the large cities you give in 12 months, and even if it's up in the middle of the winter, you could send them out. But why? In the middle of the winter, he, he's sending him into the street. It shouldn't be allowed. So therefore, now the Gemara says another shot. After the after Again? After the winter. No, no, no. Yeah, from when? From when his time? From when his rental is up? You have to give him 12 months before you send him out. So it's, it could end up in even middle of the winter. So how are you allowed to send him out? So the Gemara now says another pshat. Amar Rav Yehuda, Rav Yehuda says the pshat of the Mishnah is totally different. Lahidia ketani. What the Mishnah is talking about is the notice that you have to give this person when his rental is up. And Omar, and this is what it's saying here. Amaske bayis lachaveidoi. You rent the house to your friend. In our Gemara it says stam that you rented it to him and you didn't give him a specific time. But Rashi doesn't learn this way. Rashi says you rented the friend, your friend a house, and you gave him a specific time. And the time of the rental is up. But nevertheless, even though the time of his rental is up, you can't send him out. You cannot send him out of the house during the winter from Sukkot until Pesach. Unless you let him know 30 days before the winter started. Since during the winter, he won't be able to find a rental. During the summer, he'll be able to find a rental. So therefore, you have to notify him 30 days before the winter started, which means, when does the winter begin? Sukkis. Tezvav Tishrei. So you have to notify him, Tezvav Elul, and then you could send him out. And similar, the halacha would be during the summer. During the summer, when you could find the rentals, but you have to give him 30 days during the summer to be able to find. But if you didn't let him know those 30 days before, then during the winter, you can't send him out at all. That's what the Mishnah was saying. As I mentioned, according to Rashi, this is even if you gave him a set time for the rental, and the rental is up in the middle of the winter. It doesn't matter. You still have to have notified him before the summer that I'm planning on actually sending you out when the rental is going to be up. If you don't give him that warning 30 days before the winter starts, you're not allowed to send him out. Other Rishayim disagree. Other Rishayim argue is here in the Gemara as it says Stam, that this is only by a Stam rental that you have to give him that warning 30 days before. But if it's not a Stam rental, then even in the middle of the winter, you're able to send him out. Tan, Yanami Yochi, we learned like this, Pshat Nabrai says, well, Kisha Omru Shloishim, when it says in the Mishnah the, the time of 30 days, or Kisha Omru Shnei Masachaydish, then when it says in the Mishnah regarding a, a person that's renting in, this, in the large city, that you have to uh, give him 12 months, what this is saying is that you have to notify him, the warning that you have to give him in advance, whether you have to give him 30 days before the winter starts, or you have to give him 12 months. Okay, now, okay, that's the halacha regarding a, a landlord notifying the renter. And now the Braise continues, just like a landlord has to notify the renter if he wants to send them out. And as the halachas that we just said, during the winter, 30 days before, so to the renter, if he's deciding <laughs> to leave from his rental, and that's even if, he's, if, the, if that's the time when the rental is up and he's deciding to leave, he has to let him know in advance. Because otherwise, he's going, he could tell him, if you would let me know, I would, I would make my effort and find a good renter. So you should let me know in advance. If you're not going to let me know in advance, you have to stay here until I'll be able to find another renter. Here, regarding this halacha of the renter notifying the landlord, it's not clear in the Gemara exactly what he has to notify him. There's a discussion in the Shainim exactly how this applies regarding this case. Omar Avasi. Avasi said, If the renter is in the house and it entered one day into the winter, You can't send them out from Sukkis, the beginning of the winter, until Pesach. So the Gemara asks on this statement of Ravasi, We said that you have to give him the warning 30 days before. If you give him the warning 30 days before, you can take him out. And if not, not. So what does he mean to say, if you entered one day in, you can't send him out? And so the Gemara, what Ravasi meant to say is as follows, Then Pesach. As mentioned before, the winter starts, Tess of Tishrei. So you have to give him the warning 30 days before, which is from Tesva Velo. What Ravasi is saying is, if one day passed from Tesva Velo, you gave him the warning Tezayin Elo. So now he gets a warning 29 days, because it's one day in, it's too late. So then you can't take him out of your house for the entire winter. That's what Ravasi is saying. 30 days means take it 30 full days. Omar Ravone, Ravone says, now even though we just said you can't take the person out of your house, but the imbol Rav is bedameh Omer but if his, according to Rashi's pshat, the time of his rental was up, 
and now you're not allowed to send them out of the house because you didn't give them a warning be- 30 days before the winter, but you can, you can hire, you can uh, uh, raise the rent, and that might force them out. If you can't pay their rental, it'll force them out. You can raise the rent. Rav Nachman says, no, you can't do that. Hi, link it to the You're grabbing hold of him and you're hurting him. And you say, I'm not going to let go of you until you give me your garment. That's basically what you're doing here. You're hiring the person's rent. So you're causing him to have so much pain that it's going to force him out. What difference does it make if you're throwing him out or you're just raising the rent that he's going to be forced to leave? So if you're not allowed to send him out, you're not allowed to raise his rent either. So the Gemara answer is, no, the halacha of... His halacha was, in what case, the The reason why you're raising this rent is because the rent of the house has went up. So now, if the person, is, his rental is up. It's true, it's the middle of the winter, you can't send them out because you didn't give him the warning. But if the rental of all houses went up, you can raise the rent according to the price of rent, what it is then. That is allowed. The following halachas are poshet. If the house of the landlord collapsed, and now the landlord himself doesn't have where to live, so now the landlord can say to the renter, and according to Rashi, we're talking about over here, in a case where the rental, the time of the rental was up already. He gave him a set time for the rental, and the time of this rental is up already. LMI, it's a time when he can't send him out, because it's the winter, or he didn't give him the warning. But nevertheless, in a case where the landlord's own house collapsed, and he has nowhere to live, so he says to the renter, you're not any better than me. Really, your rental is up already. LMI, I'm not allowed to send you out into the street during the winter when you when I didn't give you the proper warning. But now I'm in the street. I don't have where to live. So you're not any better than me. It's my house, and therefore you have to leave. Zavne, oy orte, oyav, matane, another Allah which is Pashit, if the landlord sold his house, or it, he died and his children inherited it, or he gave it as a gift to someone else, and that is a new landlord. And he wants to send out the renter. Amalei, so the renter says, Leadifis Megavre the Ostas Mine. You're not any better, you're no different than the person that you bought this property from. Just like he would not have the right to send me out in this time period if he didn't give me the proper warning, you now also don't have, you're not, you're not any different than him. What's the halacha where the landlord married off his son and he needs a place for his son to live and he wants to send out this renter without the proper warning? So Chazino, we look to see what the situation is. If it's a case where the chasana, he became a chasana, and there was a long period until the chasana, and he had time to notify the renter to leave. So he boiled it. So then he should have notified him. And if he did not give him the proper warning, as the Mishnah says, then he can't send out this renter for his son's, uh, for, for the son to have a place to live. But Viloy, if the son got engaged and got married right away and it was impossible to, re- to, to warn him in advance, so then Amalei, Loi Adifis Minoi. So then he tells him, you're, the time of your rental is up. So LMI, you're going to be thrown out into the street because you can't find another place to rent. But, but instead, my son is going to be in the street. So I'm the landlord, I'm the owner of the house. My son is not less than you. So therefore, you have to leave and allow my son to live here. The mother finishes over here with an interesting story. Ahu Gavre was a story with a person, the Zoven Arba de Chamre. He bought a whole shipload of wine. He didn't find a place where to store it. So Amalala, he hits He says to this woman, she was a single woman living in a house and she had space. Do you have space for me to rent, to, to, to place my shipment of wine here? Amalala, she says to him, Loi, sorry, I have no place for you. Azal Kitsha. So he went, he got friendly with her, and then he was Makadashar. He married her. And he said, So obviously now it's his wife. So she gave him a place uh, to, to bring in his uh, shipload of wine to, to, to store there. Azala Bey say, Now this person was, was, was not honest. He was a thief. He went home and cost of Logita and he sends her a get and he divorces her. He only married her so he could have a place where to store his wine. <laughs> Shadal and he sends the get to her. So what did she do? Azla Ihi. So she went. Agrash Kuloi. She hired workers. And she paid the workers from this wine itself. And uh, she took it out from her house. She put it out into the street. So the question is, is she allowed to do that or not? He's, he's renting it from her. We're discussing over here. You're allowed to throw out a renter or not. So, he paid money? Yeah, he paid. It was still in the middle of the time of the rental. Yeah, yeah, he paid for this. He rented it. So, uh, well, actually, it said that he, she gave him the space. She gave him the permission. Okay, but she, she took it out. Did she have the right to do this to just, without notifying him? Maybe that's the point there. Without notifying him, just put it out into the street. 
So the Gemara says, Amr Avonu Berei that Rabbi Shua, she's able to do this. Kasha also, Ken Yasa Loi. Like what he did to her, that he went and married her, even though he wasn't interested. And this this is now going to be done back to him. That even though maybe usually she wouldn't have the right just to take out his barrels of wine, but because he was dishonest, so she could do a dishonest <laughs> thing and take it out of his house. Gemula Yasha Berei Whatever he paid, whatever he did to her, is done back to him. And the Gemara explains, The fact that she has the right to do this is not only in a situation where the place where the wine was stored is in a place where it's not even made for this storage. It's not made to be rented for this kind of things. Even if it's a place that's intended for this kind of storage, but nevertheless, she can take it out. She can say to him, I'm interested in renting out the space to anybody else. But for you, I'm not interested in renting out for you this place. The dumbest alike, you're like a lion that's attacking me. And therefore, I, she can take out all this wine from the space, even without notifying him. The last thing he said in the Mishnah was, Rabshum Gamliel Lai Mishal Nachtaim, Shal Tzavoim, Shal Lishanim. When you have someone that's renting a space as a baker or as a dyer, so over here, you have to give him three years' notice before you send him out. Tana, what's the reason? Mipnei Shakefa Merube. Because he sells to people on credit and people pay him up only after a long period of time, so you have to give him the time to remain there to collect the money that people owe him.